I'm Elia Hubbard for the Beirut Banyan. It's Monday night and I'm in Martyr Square. Today was a busy day in politics. We had a speech by Riyad Saleme, followed by multiple political leaders giving their own take on what's going on, including the cancellation of the parliament session tomorrow. I'm here to interview a friend of a friend, and the reason why I'm interviewing him is that he's been very vocal online and on the ground about his take on the economical situation of the country. Here's our interview. So <laughs> let's kick things off officially now. If you don't mind, please providing me with your name, age and profession. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Pierre Madani. I'm 47 years old. I'm a chief financial officer at an institution, a financial institution in, uh, in Beirut. Uh, our job basically is to provide um, letters of guarantees for small and medium enterprises wishing to benefit from bank loans in specific sectors such as industry, as industry, tourism, agriculture, high technology, uh, ICTs and innovative uh, projects. Okay, um, if you don't mind, since we're not a specialized audience in this podcast, would you give us an overview for dum-dums, if that's not offensive to everyone, of our current situation? What does it mean, as easy as you can, uh, given especially that um, Riyad Saleme just spoke and what the banking sector is going through? Okay, sure. To understand the problem, we have to understand how the Lebanese economic model works. So we're basically a society based on consumption. For every hundred dollars worth of goods or services that we export to the outside world, we import almost seven hundred dollars worth of goods and services. So that makes around, give or take, like six hundred dollars. So basically we will need to cover that deficit. We need to provide that deficit in US dollars since we deal with the exterior world in US dollars. Nobody would take our Lebanese lira, no other currency for exchange. So we have to provide that deficit. How did we manage to get by all these years? Well, we managed to convince the world that we have a great banking sector, we have a, a fine and sound financial sector, and we're offering high interest rates basically. So we attracted a tons of foreign depositors, okay, and they deposited their money at local banks, at Lebanese banks. And to understand how a bank works, it has resources, which is the customer's deposits, and what it does with it, with those deposits, it's either it lends to particular for consumption or for production, that's part of their utilization of those deposits. But in Lebanon, they use mostly, almost half of it, for what we call treasury operations. It means we either lend the public sectors through treasury bonds or euro bonds. So we're passing money to the government, which is lending, borrowing that money, okay, for high interest rates. All right. And recently, we also lent the Central Bank of Lebanon almost $60 billion worth of deposits which we deposited for long term at the central bank at a higher interest rate ranging between 15 and 17 percent for like five or six years worth and there's what we call what what remains is cash and banks cash and banks is the available money that you should provide for particulars who wish to withdraw their money which we call like uh, cash withdrawals, what bank notes, for example, if somebody comes to the bank and he has a current account and he wants to withdraw his money, all right? So the bank should be able to provide this liquidity for him. And what we have now is a liquidity squeeze, a shortage in this item, exact item of the balance sheet of the bank, because we put so much money in lending the government, buying treasury bonds, or euro bonds and lending the central bank not to mention lending particulars but lending particulars is only 40 percent of those deposits and they have maturities long maturities so what remains this available money this thin layer of available money cannot cover all the demand for withdrawals especially if there's a trust issue 
or confidence issue which we are witnessing now. People are rushing to the banks, wishing to withdraw their available money and they can have full access to it. So basically that's what created this, I would call it liquidity crisis. Okay, but this liquidity crisis, it shows one thing. It shows a system in really dire times because in order to keep that system coming, we have to rely on fresh money coming from outside, more foreign depositors to come put their money at the banks, which is not happening at the moment. We used to rely on transfers from Lebanese, from the diaspora, what we call, or is worth like $7 billion a year. Now this $7 billion is not enough to cover this level of spending, this on and on going of lending the government, lending the government. And we've been seeing returns, but actually they've been paying us from our own money. This interest we've been perceiving is from our own money. And this is the definition of a Ponzi scheme. So having said that, if you care to comment on what was said in today's announcement by Riyad Salehme, which took almost an hour, and the recent developments or the recent actions seen in the private banks. Okay, what the head of the Central Bank of Lebanon, the governor of the Central Bank of Lebanon did, was a boring technical display and a really a PPT presentation of how our things went from the early 90s till now. But what he was actually doing was describing the things as I said them. However, he mentioned a point. He said that the liquidity crisis led to a rise in interest rates. And that's where I think he uh, misinterpreted the crisis. What happened is the exact opposite. Since 2015 and ever since Bankmed and Bank Audi, one of the two big banks in Lebanon, made offshore operations that were catastrophic, he organized what everybody now is calling this financial engineering. He made in a way, he passed them cheap money through these financial engineering, which made them returns of like a billion dollars or more worth. So all the banks, they got uh, jealous of that by allowing the banks to deposit huge amounts at the central bank and giving them these high interest rates. Well, everybody went into the race because they were afraid they would lose their customers. They would go to these other banks who were offering high rates offered by the governor himself as a spread between the bank's deposit at the central bank and consequently the interest rate that the bank is allowed to give his depositors. There was a huge interest spread. For example, a bank could deposit a billion dollars at the central bank at 15% and he would allow himself to give a depositor in US dollar an interest of 8 or 9% and still keep like 6 or 7% spread on the, on the dollar. And that, that led all the banks in this frantic rush for depositing these, this money at the central bank. So what happened is those high interest rate led those banks to put all their resources in these term deposits with the central bank, which eventually created this liquidity squeeze. So we can safely say that the high interest rates were the cause of the liquidity squeeze and not the opposite, as he mentioned. The liquidity squeeze was translated in higher interest uh, rates. That's not true. He began the thing by giving very high interest rates on those special deposits with him and everybody went in and therefore led to this liquidity squeeze. So he was not accurate in describing this one in my opinion. The second thing is now what he suggests as a solution, he's suggesting to the bank to lend them back the same money they lent him at 15% only at 20% this time. This means the banks are going to lose at least 5% spread and it's going to cause them huge losses unless and I hope that's not the case they're going to break their commitment towards their depositors and lower the interest rates even before maturities. I hope not but I hope they wait till each and every deposit matured and then lower the interest rates because that's the natural outcome of that issue. So what we would expect in the coming days more deposits are going to have returns that are going to go down because they're going to, he's going to, banks are going to lower the interest rates. They're going to borrow money at 20%. They already incurred a 5% loss. 
on those deposits and they're going to try to minimize this loss more and more by giving less interest to their own depositors. And also he talked about capital control and that there are no capital control. Well, technically there is a sort of capital control, but I am afraid without a law that enforces capital control, this thing remains random and subject to the uh, discretion of the management of each bank. And I'm afraid they would let those big depositors get away with it. Let's be, let's be realistic. If there are powerful people who can pull strings, they can manage for their assets to go outside since there is no official capital control measure. So what should have been done is a legislation. Since capital control, it's an infringement to the liberty of contract. The contractual liberty in Lebanon is guaranteed. But viewing the current situation, a law should have been promulgated at the House of Representatives that supersedes this liberty of contract and says, because of force majeure, we're going to impose capital control so that no big money goes out of Lebanon, unless there are, of course, exceptions to finance specific trade operations or small amounts that parents send to their children for their tuition or stuff like that. But no big depositors are allowed to transfer their money outside. Right now, as we speak, they talk about measures similar to capital control, but we can never be sure what they're going to do really when they open tomorrow about the haircuts and about capital control. He said, first, it's not legal, and second, it's something that they do not want. So he used a, a term in, in Arabic, uh, he's emphasizing both. However, as you already mentioned, strings can be pulled. We've been in crisis for a month now. I'm guessing anyone who wanted to pull a string already did. What do you think is a responsible next step, knowing that having those laws take effect now will not necessarily control the big uh, capitals. Okay, first of all, the first thing he said that was not legal, he's right about that, because as I said before, contractual freedom is guaranteed and capital controls are an infringement to these laws, that's for sure. So you need a, a superseding law that will freeze this liberty of contract and impose capital control. So this, this part he said is true, it's not legal. La nuridu, how we don't want it, well, it's subject to interpretation. The easiest one would be, we had privileged people, we might, I don't know, they might pull some strings to let their money out. Or, also, it's a confidence issue. Remember, banking is about trust and, and reputation. So if you do that, people who believe in freedom of transactions will be really, really, really um, skeptic about the, pr the future prospects of Lebanese bank and possibly after all this is over, will not deposit a cent in Lebanese bank. I think that was legitimately a concern of his, which I could understand, I could understand. But viewing the current situation, I think that the force majeure supersedes all concerns, all fears, and it guarantees a more just and equitable and fair treatment of all depositors. Because let's face it, if you have a $20 million and you have some really good connections with the governor, well, you can ask for a phone call so that he might facilitate your transfers. I'm not saying he would, but it's not him. It's like every, anyone in the banks who has, who has power enough, leverage enough, and connections enough can really pull some strings Towards the bank management itself, you don't need to go by the, the governor since he said, I'm not imposing anything. So they might go to these respective administrations uh, of the banks and ask for their money to be transferred and their, their request might be uh, met to, with the acceptance. And this is a concern because it leaves more small depositors to face their fate and all the big depositors uh, got away with it. And they took all these high interests all those years and now they're leaving up, up to the small and medium depositors to have only their skin in the game. I mean, personally, I think everyone's skin should be in the game, including those of the middle and top management at banks. If you're so sure about your system, well, the best thing to do is to put your money on the line as well, not to flee. But as we learned in, in college and everywhere, well, capital is the most coward instrument at all. It's first to leave and the last to come back. We've seen some action plans circulating online on what should be done next. And we just highlighted how any action now, after a month of confusion, may not really 
impact big capital. What are your thoughts on what is a sober action plan? Okay, first of all, we're in the middle of the collapse. Practically, there are no action plans now. We're still waiting. We're just watching it happen. And all those circulating like PDFs with people signing underneath and academics and uh, offering their uh, their economic slash financial advice. To me, they're not even worth the paper they're printed on or the bytes they've been transferred with. For the first time in the history of modern Lebanon, like that's a hundred years now, we're witnessing a collapse of a whole economic system. It's the first time that happens, a complete collapse. And what emerges next is what we call the emergence of complex systems. And that's highly unpredictable. It's not fathomable at all. You just watch agents interact and choose many paths of evolution and then converge at some point, diverge at some. There are very, very high, you know, broad terms to describe what should happen, but in no measure they could be a, a, a roadmap. These are basically a set of behaviors, what happens. People tend to consume less now. They have to consume less. This seven to one deficit in our trade balance, commercial trade balance, cannot continue anymore. So we'll have to learn how to be sober about it. We cannot consume what we don't produce, basically. We have to lower down our consumption. That's abroad. How? I don't know. Actually, it's every agent's role to find out himself. There are really broad guidelines, but there are no specific formulas for success. I mean, take Greece, for example. They've been living that for five, six years, and so far they're not out of it. Argentina, they lived it in 2001. And from what I hear and what I read about them, we're in 2019, they barely came back to the levels, to their level, economic levels that were in 2000. So they've been slowly climbing up that hole they dug themselves into. So we don't know. The really honest answer is that we don't know. We have to figure it out. And it takes time. This is all I can say. We have to work on ourselves. We have to surely become more productive than consumer. That's for sure. How? We don't know. We will find out. We have to sober up this culture of what I call in Arabic papas and show off should stop. Well, actually, it doesn't matter what I'm saying. Those people who are showing off with money they don't have now, they will adjust automatically or they will be ruined. And it's their fault if, they, if it does happen. And personally, I have no sympathy for them because they're not learning. The best positive thing I can see from all this is that suffering will be our learning tool. And I hope it will be our learning tool. Amid all this uncertainty that we're facing, um, it's been almost a month since protests started. What did you learn in the last three or four weeks? Okay, up until October 16th, I was very cynical about the situation, very skeptic, watching those sheep going to the slaughterhouse, getting slaughtered without doing anything, without flinching an eye. And it really appalled me. And at the end, I was really, really extremely skeptic of the Lebanese as a collective. And then 17th of October came, and I was positively shocked. And I was really pleasantly surprised. Well, that's the attitude of the skeptic. You can either get vindicated or pleasantly surprised. There is no other third option. So I was pleasantly surprised in Arabic, so with the attitude of my people. But yes, there is still there are people. They're still alive and they're willing to fight. They're willing to kick. They wouldn't stand for this abuse, even though they were participative. In a way or another, each to his own proportion, to this level of corruption and exuberance in spending. We all participated in a way or another. But it was, it was really positive to see those people, I mean, come together and stick for what they want. And slowly, I mean, administering blows to this uh, class of politicians, of inept politicians, apart from being greedy, corrupt criminals and thieves and they were moronic and idiotic as it gets. And all the what happened in the last three weeks proved that. They didn't know who they were dealing with. They didn't know that the, what those, those protests were decentralized. They didn't have a leader, they were leaderless. They didn't know who they were dealing with, and that killed them. 
that, that took them like two, three weeks to understand, to start to fathom what's happening. And I, my own guess, they still don't know. They think that there should be a leader and a mass and a core and people who walk behind it. If we kill the leader, we kill the revolution. That's not the case anymore. The 21st century is not about ideology. It's about behavior. It's about social media. It's about nods forming networks and networks talking with each other and forming really a unity though keeping their decentralized aspects which will move to my second thought on what's going to happen a really really a proponent for localism in Lebanon give more power to small entities let's get done with this central corrupt policy of keeping everything at the central level of governance more power to the municipalities more power to the muhafazat more power to local communities that will uh, enable a more dynamic system of competition. Corruption will remain, but it will remain on a smaller scale and it will be seen by peers and locals who know you. If you're greedy at a level that they cannot accept, they will get someone less greedy than you, to be realistic about it. And that, that, that fosters a culture of really political dynamics within a smaller, smaller systems, not a smaller, smaller systems of administration and which suits, in my opinion, the, the structure of Lebanon itself. So having said that, why are you still protesting? You said you were positively shocked, but why are you still here? Well, because as it's showing, the more we persist, the more we're getting what we want. I mean, today we managed to postpone this legislative, this, uh, this session of shame to give a, a pardon for every criminal since 1992 uh, onward. So I think we achieved something to see the Speaker of the House be one of the most powerful people in, in Lebanon, the Kaiser Soze of, of uh, Lebanese politics, admit in a way or another that there is something happening on the street that is forcing them to recalculate, to, to, to reposition himself. Well, to me, that's good enough. I mean, well, if you smell blood, you, you carry on. You go for the jugular. After your initial Aalbak Mithl al-Asal, do you remember seeing anything on the streets or maybe online that surprised you and you were like, is this Lebanon? Yeah, I've seen people uh, buying uh, snacks, driving themselves to the place of protest and distributing them. That's their own contribution and no safarat, no embassies, no otpor, no international uh, Freemasonry, no US, no Iran, no Saudi Arabia, no invaders from Mars. Nothing like that. It's just organic. I've seen these things with my own eyes and I'm not an agent for anyone. I'm just a simple person, just a simple employee in a, in a modest uh, institution and I've seen those things, really. That was warm felt. In the hopes of having more people share your experience, what would you tell people who are still hesitant to join in the protests? Okay, basically how you deal with people begins on the peripheric, peripheral um, layer of being a mass. You can be apathetic, then start to move to being a spectator, then be, I mean, neutral, a neutral spectator, then move on to the sympathy, then basically you take action. So I'm telling for all those on the outside yet, just watch, just let time pass and see for yourself and decide for yourself. Nobody's forcing you. But one thing I can say for sure, for people under the age of 30, I'm 47, this is not my time anymore. I can barely understand your needs and wants. I'm 47, I'm old, I'm vieux jeu already. These people want something different and they know how to get it differently than us. And this is partly the reason why this political class failed to see the underlying roots and causes of this harak. My final question now. Let's say you're looking at this moment in our history a year from now. What do you think people will remember or what do you want them to remember? I wanted to remember that girl who gave a karate kick to this jerk-off bodyguard. Yeah, that symbolizes everything. We're not going to be silent anymore. And this is a signal that if we don't like anything, something of value, of substance, that will really touch the, the intricacies of our like, particular lives, we're going to take the streets. And that, to me, is a powerful weapon that people started discovering lately.
Elia Haber, signing off from Martyr Square for the Beirut Banyan.